This episode was brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for business. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Unstoppable. Today's guest, we have Harry Moffat. Uh, and Harry Moffat recently retired from the Australian Defence Force after almost 30 years, which was spent with Australia's Elite Special Air Service, also known as the SAS Regiment, as a team commander and team specialist. He's recently written uh, his first book called 11 Bats, where Harry shares his stories as an SAS operator and team commander and how cricket had a profound impact on his life on and off the pitch and on the battlefield as well. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please welcome to the show, Harry, great to have you here, mate. Thanks, Kerwin. Good to be here. Mate, now I've got to say, you, um, I'm always get excited when we have Spec Ops, uh, anyone from Spec Ops on the show. Um, <laughs> I uh, Full admission, I was never in the military. Uh, I would never have been accepted by the military. I had a dis- uh, an accident which left me with a, a slight disability. But I did grow up in Townsville for a, a period of time for about six years. And my best mate, uh, his parents had the um, uh, the kiosk at the Laverick Barracks Pool and the Laverick Barracks um, Movie Theatre. And so I literally spent about six years on that barracks. And uh, I got the opportunity to hang out with a whole bunch of very interesting characters. I got to be there when they had the the international crews come in for war games, and we used to go around and um, you know basically beg for for camo gear and ration packs from uh, all the uh, all the international forces. Brilliant. And I've always had a fascination with spec ops. You know, uh, you know, I've had the great privilege of being able to do some work with some of the uh, Navy SEALs in the US. I've had the great privilege of being able to do some training uh, with Euro- European uh, spec ops over in Ukraine, um, and I. Really really admire the level of resilience, the level of grit, but also the level of coherence that's required to perform at this level. So I'm super excited about this conversation, mate. A little bit like a kid in a candy store. So I hope <laughs> you don't mind that this is going to be probably, you know, uh, it's, it's, I'm going to be like a, a kid on Christmas morning as we go through this. But um, no mate, first of all, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. No worries. Thank you. And um, a question I ask all of my guests, and this should be an interesting one. Let's say you're at a dinner party and um, you know there's eight people at this dinner party. You're one of them. You're sitting at the head of the table. Everyone sits down. The conversation is a little bit disjointed and then everyone goes really quiet and they all look at you. And uh, someone says to you, Harry, so what is it that you do? How do you answer that question? Uh, I would put my business hat on, I guess, now um, and say that I would hope that I improve and inspire everyone I meet. Uh, I that's my certainly my aim, and to leave people and places better than they than they were uh, previously. I think that that kind of value statement, if you like, personal value statement, carries across everything in my life. Whether it's my family, whether it's business, whether it's my you know, not for profit work, whether it's a game of cricket. Uh, you know, and I think if we all aspire to that, particularly as leaders, um, I find myself talking a fair bit about that uh, recently. That that's kind of my tagline, I guess. Um, you know, as I practice as a psychologist now, so that gives me, uh, I suppose, somewhat of a mandate to approach it from a from a, a, a slightly different perspective as I might might have in the past as a soldier. Um, so yeah, but I'd, I'd say that that would if if I was uh, at a dinner party and and and, and people stopped and asked that question, I'd, that's how I'd answer it for sure. So your SAS comes psychologist. I'm going to assume you did your degree later in life. Is that something more recent? Uh, I actually started it in the shock and awe campaign in Iraq. Um, I, no I did my, my 101 unit in uh, 2000. When was that? Geez, 2005. So 2005, it's been a long. Yeah. Right. Hey. Yeah, 2005, I think. Yeah, is that yeah, right? Yeah. So we 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 first went in there three. No, so it would have been oh three, oh three or four. But um. Yes, yeah, so, like I, it took me. I studied for probably fifteen years. It was always my exit plan um, to register as a psychologist. It's something I always wanted to do. I kind of I dropped out of uni initially to join the army, so uh, it was kind of a life goal. But uh, yeah, studied uh, right up until I hung up my helmet in twenty. When was that? Twenty fifteen, and um, then uh, finished my masters and research pieces and, and registered in uh, twenty nineteen. So late, late well to the done, game mate. of psychology. 
Well, mate, I, I would dare to say that your entire life was dedicated to psychology, especially working, you know, working within the um, Australian Defence Force, but more importantly, the, in, at, with with the SAS for thirty years. That in itself is would have been like, you know, for most people, that would have been four or five PhDs in performance psychology with the work that you would have got to do. Is that how your interest in psychology came about? Because you know, obviously, the SAS is you know the the creme de la creme, and it's the high, the highest performing teams, you know, in the military. Is that where the interest was kind of born? Uh, it was probably before then, but you're right. You're, you're intense, right? So, and, and once I joined the S, it took on a completely different uh, flavour, a different lens uh, through which to to look at high performance. Up until then, psychology to me was interest, personality, kind of mental health thing. But there's this whole other human performance element which fascinates me now, and I. I've, uh, I've, I do a little bit of work in mental health and probably during the last 12 months of, um, have uh, that's risen. Um, but my my aim point really is on, on um, you know, human performance, how we can optimise humans and uh, and no matter who you are, you don't have, you know, we don't have to be elite people or in elite organisations to learn these lessons because the, the mm. main lesson we learn from, uh, you know, so-called elite um, uh, organisations or teams is that they do the boring stuff brilliantly? You know, that they they, mm. they they do the mundane, boring, procedural um, process type stuff, uh, right down to how they routine, you know, how they run their personal routines on a daily, weekly basis. They just do that to a, an excellent standard um, and have the discipline to get up and do that every day. So, uh, the military for me uh, really brought that to the fore. And so that's set about a, a, a bunch of reading and and uh, research that I may not have done if I had have taken a civilian pathway. So to go back to your question, mm. it it wasn't the kind of origin point for me for uh, for psychology, but it's it, it has profoundly impacted the uh, the trajectory of my interest. One of the things that I obsess about when it comes to performance and the reason I'm so obsessed with Spec Ops is because you guys really do have to practice the fundamentals and the basics and the routines with such a level of um, frequency and consistency under, in most cases, duress, stress, high stakes scenarios that enable you to function and function coherently and clearly in situations that would destroy most people within the first 15 seconds. And so to me, I find that level of um, uh, capability quite interesting. But I also find th th what's most interesting is that as a capability, is that a capability that you believe can be learned? And what I also find is a little bit of a segue here, the beauty in what you do, most people are never going to have to go to war, but if they have the psychology that a spec ops operator has, that would give most people a significant advantage in the business space. Yeah, definitely. So, so the the short answer is yes, it can be learned. Um, I guess how we, uh, but we generally you don't have time or the resources to train people explicitly in some of the, I suppose, some of the the, the cognitive tools in particular. So you know you can train people to be fit and strong, and and uh, uh, and in a similar way you can do that psychological cognitively. So there's a lot, there's a whole series of <clears throat> mental skills and cognitive skills that we that we teach operators. Uh, for example, chunking and segmentation when you're in the grind. You know, a characteristic of these organisations, no matter military, sports, co corporates, a characteristic is it's high work ratios, uh, long hours, long duration effort. And um, and chunking and segmentation is just a way of breaking up your day um, mm. from hours to 30 minute blocks to 15 minute blocks. And I've just been uh, talking in the US just before this call uh, with a guy by the name of Luke Hutton who's about to do a you know 40 day endurance event, event through the, through the uh, I think the north of America. And we talked a lot about that segmentation and, and chunking. So these cognitive skills are, are really important and can be learned. But what what is harder to learn and takes a lifetime is the motivation and perseverance that that uh, that that grit that people talk about, and you, that takes years to to prepare. So we have we, we're very lucky in special operations and and other mission critical teams are the same to have long selection and recruitment processes. Uh, if you're a corporate, the longest you can maybe convince a CEO to take to hire someone is maybe a couple of few weeks or maybe a couple of yeah, months, you know, right. um, and often it's done to 
too quickly is, is my observation. But we take, you know, in, in, in Perth, for example, we take two years to look at someone before we would mm. say you're 100% ready to, to roll um, and have a high attrition rate. So, we, you know, we do have that, that, um, that, that, those resources available to us to, to take a deep, deep, deep dive into people. And we're, what we're looking for is people who can, who can, uh, who can operate under uh, large stress, high stress, uh, high fatigue, uh, sleep deprivation, austere, information austere environments. Um, I like to call them uh, bricoleurs or, or, or they have this sense of bricolage, which means uh, they get shit done, you know, with minimal resources. Mm. Uh, and make shit happen. These, these, this is kind of sense that they, they're, they're jacks of all trade, uh, kind of approach, if you like. So I've um, been obsessive, as I've said about spec ops. I studied um, a lot of uh, how the Navy SEALs do their their selection, their induction. You know, buds, buds training is a six week training that most people are familiar with. That ends with uh, what's referred to as Hell Week, where you know, it's five days of sleep deprivation, fatigue, endurance, That's and right. basically hell. What's really interesting though is I remember reading information, this is going back, you know, even a few decades now, where the amount of money that the US government spends on the recruitment process, on the training process, you know, it adds up into the millions of dollars and I'd have 400 people go through, you know, a BUDS training, but they'd only ever have in most cases 20% of those people that, you know, wouldn't ring that bell and wouldn't tap out and get out the other side. And so they... They decided, well, if we can actually have less people going in and more people qualifying, it's going to save us more money. And so they did a bunch of psychometric profiling, psychological, physical profiling. And one of the things they identified, which you've kind of alluded to, is the key tr- characteristic and the key trait that determines someone's ability to graduate, whether it be in the Navy SEALs or I'm going to assume the SAS is, is similar, um, is that grit, is that resilience. And so I guess well, my first question, because a lot of people hear this word grit and they hear this term resilience being used. And so I'm going to put this in a two-part up. First part, of what is grit? What is resilience? And secondly, once we've got an understanding and a, and a context for that, why is it so hard to be able to find that? Because what I discovered is even though they knew that grit and resilience was a key factor, they still would have, you know, no matter how they applied that to their recruitment process, they'd still only get 20% of people coming through that were able to actually graduate. Why is grit so hard to assess? What is grit and why is it so hard to assess? Yeah, it's a, a career, curiosity and I, I'm, I still uh, marvel at this or wonder at this uh, – so if you take the, the let's just it's it's much more complex than this. But if you take the Five Eyes community that we are uh, kind of an embedded part of, uh, UK, US, um, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, we all have very similar selection profiles and selection criteria, etc. It's very similar across both the U- UK and both the US units, and that that, that sprinkles into into Europe, Norcom, you know, SOCOM in Norway, and and others as well. Um, and yet, yet you're picking from 350 million in the US. Yet the the tier one um, units there, the seals and and the uh, um, uh, special forces, you know, you at the army special forces units, uh, they're still the same size. They're relatively speaking the same size as the Australian unit, as the Kiwi unit, as the UK units, and it's a, it's a quite a curiosity. Um, and it has implications for workload, etc. So back to your question, resilience and grit. Well, I've, I've got a I've, I've got a stock standard answer, and then Harry's kind of addition to that. And resilience, we know, is bouncing back from adversity. Uh, it's being put under pressure, put under stress, put under fatigue, and then uh, and then being able to operate. Uh, in that context, without uh, without failing or without you know, at a at a high level, and um, you know, and 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 grit is that perseverance, uh, that doggedness. Um, it's I think it's a little bit of that craziness. You need to be um, you need to kind of first put yourself in the breach and then continue through that voice in your head, having command of that voice in most of our heads. Uh, and having control over it, and uh, and and being able to crack on and not not let that wear you down. So that that's kind of a I suppose a broad kind of bouncing back from adversity. But I would add one more thing to that. I, I really love this notion of uh, being anti fragile. So it's a it's a you know I, I suppose a novel uh, yeah uh, like concept uh, from Nassim Taleb, who who you might remember wrote the Black Swan, and and um, and so his his take on it is that resilience is great. You bounce back to normal. But 
he he says that uh, in 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 truly learning systems or adaptive systems that not only do you bounce back from adversity, but you actually benefit from adversity and you recognise mm. that. And I think that's a key indicator, a key difference in, in, the, uh, in the literature for me, um, that, that, anti, that notion of being anti-fragile. And there's no other word for it. I won't go into the why it's called anti-fragile because um, it gets a bit uh, esoteric. But I, I think so. That's, that would be common to me. In athletes, uh, you know, particularly look at long duration events. Athletes who do, you know, um, you know, as I said, I referred to the young gentleman before who's doing, you know, the Iditarod Trail or something like that. It's four hundred and fifty miles over thirty days, pulling a sled through the snow in the mountains, and oh, you know, fuck. you can't see ten feet in front of you. Um, that that takes another level of resilience, which I think is kind of beyond that, and we see that in uh, in the special forces. Um, your your point around let's go back to the kind of criteria of what what it is we don't really there just there is no kind of personality profile that we've found to select people we've there's been a lot of research done in this space and you know grit and resilience are, are kind of a, a bit of a uh, I suppose a broad term you know but if you want to go down to personality you know if you look at the the big five personality factors openness conscientiousness neuroticism etc. There's no one personality style um, that fits all of those, but uh, but what comes back time and time again is just this uh, this inner um, you know competitiveness, I guess, and we that's that's you can only see that if you completely strip someone back and put a, mm. a large amount of physiological, psychological, and even social pressures on them. You, you can't really see that those those deep characteristics. They're tacit. They're deep they're hard to explain and um and i think uh you know resilience and grit probably capture that to it to an extent i forgot the second party question kerwin um was how do we measure how do we measure grit or because here's and here's i'll give you a bit more context because i know for me i i look for grit in team members and i'm pretty sure with the organizational work that you do now and you know as i've already said you know you did 30 years 11 deployments you know over 11 years you've you've seen active service and so you know the importance of having some a team member that's got grit a team member that's got resilience because in those situations they're the people that are going to have your back they're the people who are going to be able to support you, especially under duress and stress, which in, you know, in an active combat situation is, you know, pretty much every single moment of the day that you're awake. But then we come into the organizational perspective, and those qualities are just as important because we want someone that's going to be able to be resilient in when it comes to stress, resilient when it comes to social pressure, resilient when it comes to put the you know the performance pressure that comes with you know working in a high performance environment. And so I know for me personally, whenever I'm interviewing someone. You know, unfortunately, we can't do Hell Week when we take people through the interview process, you know, to be able to strip people back. And I, and like you said, I think many times it's not only CEOs get hired, I think most people get hired too quickly because we don't really have the context or the space to be able to put three people, people through their paces to see who really does have the grit. And so for, for me, what I look for is I look for people who've got competitive backgrounds, you know, competitive sports, competitive, um, you know, uh, even competitive fighting, uh, um, uh, military discipline, something, even if they've had to play, if they've played the guitar for like 16 years. When you're assessing grit, how do you assess grit without having to take someone through two years of stripping them back mentally, emotionally, and physically in order to determine if they're going to be a good fit for a high performance environment? Yeah, you hit on something really important that, that I actually do value highly is what do they do in their spare time or what have they done? What skills have they learned? Uh, discretion in a discretionary kind of way. So yes, uh, musical instruments. Um, a guy that we looked at uh, recently, hire which we we're, we're going to hire. Um, you know, you pull back the layers a little bit and find out that he's a man, he's a, a a car nut and he does his little kind of Russian cars and does them up and builds the engines and all the rest of it. And that really resonated with me above the other candidates. There's that that's track record in focus, attention. Um, you know, mechanical reasoning, um, all you know, a whole bunch of uh, criteria that kind of tick boxes, I think, under the grit kind of or, or, or related to resilience and grit. Um, you know, goal achievement, goal attainment and, uh, and and taking pride in one's work, you know. So I, I think that's you, you, you've hit on something really important for me there. Um, look, you know, I, I, I don't think you can... Uh, I find it it's difficult in corporate settings to see how you can assess for grit other than doing, I, I suppose, um, 
uh, written surveys or, or questionnaires, self-report questionnaires, and some of the some of the hiring places do do that. Um, so, yeah, um, uh, but I, I'm not so sure that it's as easy to do as as a self-report. Um, I, I still think there's uh, there's a lot to be uh, evolved in the in that process, particularly for high performance organisations. When I, I would, you know, my message to employers and people who own businesses is that be, have a bit of courage and build a bigger, stronger um, hiring process. You know, put put some more money into it. I, I mean, I don't think it will be wasted money, um, and be a bit more discerning rather than being reactive. I understand the tensions. You know, you don't want to spend money ahead of time, and there's you know, it's kind of cost to uh, 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 you know whether it's effective or not, but. Um, the only way that you're going to get to that that end point is by building better processes uh, in which to kind of put people through their paces. I don't think an interview or a few interviews is going to get to how resilient someone is. So if you were going to build out a model for small businesses, medium businesses, maybe large businesses, you know, and again, everyone's budget would determine how, how, how much they're about to build a system or a process like this out. With your knowledge and your expertise, what would that look like? Because here's what I would suggest. People go, well, we don't have the time and we don't have the expense to be able to profile people to that degree. And I'd say, well, you, you do, but you're just spending the money or you're already spending the money because one bad hire on average is worth, I think to us, it's about $120,000 lost, one yeah. bad hire. Yep. You know, and the, 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 the devastating thing in the last 20 years, we calculated this um, at our executive meeting in January. We've had 723 bad hires in the last 20 years. And I look at that number, I'm like, fuck me. So I think there is a lot of value in building very robust, very difficult processes in order to put people through them. Definitely. If you were going to build one, if you were going to build one, Harry, what would it look like? Right. Well, we are. So uh, we've got a bit of different, a bit of a different approach, I guess. Um, you know, strategically, we've got different objectives to, to I think, bog standard businesses, but. Um, we will. So we we want to have a, a good catch all. Uh, you know, the, the initial the initial catch all is to build an, an awesome organisation that people want to come and work for. That's the first thing. And again, this all this all takes time. Mm. And and for us, that's all about one thing. That's reputation. I'm not really interested in the bottom line at this stage. I've only been around for about eighteen months as a business. And uh, so reputation is 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 our is a fundamental key point. And I think you're raising a really good point there. You've got to have something that people are willing to do tough stuff to get to. You've Correct. got to have a job that they want. Yeah. Okay. I think that's yeah. a really so important you, you part. Need to, yeah. yeah. You need to have that pull factor. There's no doubt about yeah. it. If you've got a shitty culture, shitty leadership, yeah. and uh, people are, you know, it's not a nice place to work. You know, when, when people leave your place, the first question they might be asked is, what was it like to work at Kerwin Inc.? You know, and, and if, if they even pause, <laughs> you're in trouble, you know. But if what you want them saying is it was awesome, it was just time for me to go. Um, so, yeah, build a, that, that's the first thing for us, a reputation. But in short, our, our, our eventual selection process, what we're heading towards is we'll go away, we'll take a, a, the, the final group away for a, a few days and invest money mm. in that way and then do some activities. You're not, it's not a selection course we're going to smash them, you know, night navigation through sideways <laughs> rain for three days on the coast of, uh, of southern Victoria. <laughs> but get in, but but go out and do some, you know, something. We, we, we demand in our employees that are coming through that they do have a physical uh, background or that, 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 that they have mm. a, a, a uh, that they are active is, you know, they don't have to be elite or anything like that, but they have to have physical activity built into their day because a lot of what we do revolves around that. So it's part of our value statement. So that, that few days away with your core last five people, uh, and you're picking one out of those, uh, you get a deeper look. And I think, it's, it's, you know, it really doesn't cost that much money. And you can put personality profiling. We can do interviews with the people that are away. We can have campsite fire chats. Uh, you can uh, drink too much red wine and just get a sense of uh, the, the dickhead factor. Um, you know, I just think I've just seen, uh, Kerwin, in, 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 in the impact of a, a bad employee mm -hmm. and particularly in the mm -hmm. leadership the impact of that is is just worth so much more, um, you know, negatively, obviously, uh, to the business 
then uh, that, so it's worth putting in that extra effort up front. And as you've alluded to, it costs, uh, my understanding is for every employee, whatever you've spent on them, it costs about half again to, to exit them, you know, and then rehire mm. uh, at minimum, at a minimum. When you start talking about CEOs and CFOs, it's uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know. Yeah. And I think that'd be a good exercise for business owners to go through and look at how many people have they have they gone through from a bad hire, how much has that cost them, and then reassess how much would you be willing to invest in the recruitment process in order to get a better result. You um you, you mentioned profiles. Is there a, a grit profile that you'd recommend? And I think, and again, I know this is hard to profile for, but are there any profiles that you guys use as indicative when it comes to assessment? You know, when it, as a as a written or a, as an oral. No, I, so I don't recommend um, scales and uh, uh, you know, rating systems that don't have a deep, deep uh, research base. So the, the starting point for me is always the big five personality factor. It underpins just about everything. Um, and the self-reports on grit, determination, resilience, etc. I, I, I I couldn't advocate any single one, and I wouldn't. I, I'm not convinced that self-reporting about your own resilience is actually uh, is is gives you much insight. Um, I think sitting down, having a one-on-one -on -one interview, and, uh, and uh, searching for track record in the past uh, is is far far better. In fact, I, I yeah, the more no more I see it, and the more I use it, this the, the self-reporting um, tools are fraught. Um, you can actually mm. pick up the wrong people because I'll tell you that they're Machiavellian in their thinking. The honest people will be honest, and the uh, the, the the other people will will tell you what you want to hear, and it's a bit more it's a little more difficult. Um, but there are you know there's a life resilience scales um, that uh, I think out of Edith Cowan in university in WA by Pool um, Julianne Pooley I think was one that's got a, a huge. Uh, a good research base to it, but um, yeah, we don't. Well, I wouldn't wouldn't be using those myself. Okay. So you you effectively now you've moved you you've uh, you're now the director of um, director of performance at the Stoughton Group. You're also the APAC director of um, Mission Critical Institute. Institute. Your Stoughton Group. That's your your project with um, with your group that you've got there. Are you essentially now taking all of the lessons that you've learnt? over the 30 years of special air service, and you're now deploying that in the organisational environment for high performance? Yeah, so it, that goes right to the centre. Uh, exactly. We want to – all of the lessons, as I said before, all the lessons that are learned from whether it's special ops, whether it's uh, NASA, whether it's um, you know uh, elite sports, uh, uh, um, or even in, in, in high-performing finance teams or hedge funds that, you know, that are kind of the – the, uh, the shiny um, shiny organisations that attract really high performing people. Uh, again, coming back to to what they do, uh, the lessons are similar across all of those mm. uh, across all of those organisations. But in sport and in the military, increasingly, there's a lot more science attached to it. In corporates, it's just gut feel, and all, some of the organisations succeed in spite of themselves. You know, it's just through brute effort. Uh, getting deals across the line, et cetera. So I, I think, we think, our thesis is, is that there is a high-performance program that can learn lessons from elite sports, military and other domains that can come over and build uh, high-performance programming, so proper programs that can uh, mm. sit around HR and well-being and all this other stuff, actually program, be a lot more deliberate about um, how how uh, you develop high performance uh, cultures. What, one thing I like to talk about is that most corporate businesses leave it to default. That they, 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 the culture's kind of not, you know, it's nurtured in kind of piecemeal ways or health and wellbeing over here and a free gym membership there and a lunch there, et cetera. But none of it's really connected in a, a complex adaptive network type of way. Whereas in an athletes or a sports team, for example, their programs are all interwoven and they're all mutually supporting, whether it's the bio, the psycho or the social aspects of those programs. Um, and then it's tied back to development. And I think that's the part that we're exploring now with a few businesses 
Um, and uh, you know, our, our thesis is that we're close. We're close to proving our thesis that there is a way to connect these and have a corporate style high performance program that's non, you know, it doesn't cost a, a lot, but it just pulls everything mm. together in terms of, um, you know, how we treat our people and develop our people. I'm so glad to hear that because, you know, as I said, I've been obsessed with um, performance for, you know, over 30 years now. And when, it, when we teach our clients performance strategies outside of, you know, strategic and tactical ex- um, planning and execution, I would say 80% of what I teach business owners comes from military and specifically spec ops. And what well, I've observed is- We borrow it from sports when- and, uh, and aerospace, <laughs> yeah, exactly. so it kind of it kind of set you all. Yeah. It's all incestuous. Like performance to me is very incestuous. You, you go with the elite, from the elite levels of any any industry, and you can take lessons, and you'll go, "Wow, they're doing the same thing in sport that they're doing in military, and they're doing the same things in military that they're doing in, you know, when it comes to uh, um, aeronautical and um, and even what NASA's doing." But what I'm curious to know is, it, it seems to be something that is lacking, and it sounds like you guys are getting cro- close to cracking the code. Do you guys have a model, a framework that when you go into an organization, to go, okay? Um, and I'm going to assume maybe every organization is different, but do you have a, okay, there's a seven step process, a three step, a five step model that we use, you know, when it comes to, you know, uh, putting the foundation of a performance structure in place and then actually initiating the fundamentals of routines and training and exercises that are required in order to achieve, you know, that high performance status as a team. Yes. Yes, we do. And, uh, that's, uh, close to, uh, being completed, um, we've probably got another uh, six months of work, I think, to do to kind of bring that frame, excuse me, that framework to, to bear. Uh, there's, you know, that's our kind of IP, I guess. So it's, it's. Uh, yep. we'll, we'll, I'll report back. We will share that with, in a in a report when we're finished, um, and uh, be be very open. But you know, it's interesting. You, you said about every organisation is different, and it and it and it, it is. But it doesn't mean that, that you can't have a programmatic approach that's very similar across everyone. For example, yeah. um, I work with one and two two in both in finance teams. One finance team, we've been able to build. You, you've got to find your toehold when you go into an organisation and build trust. That's that's number one. Everybody knows that it's the call of the day. But with one finance team, that trust is built around PT, going for building a, a, a you know, br- making exercise, uh, ritualistic, uh, team building and routine. And then everything else builds around there. Once there's, once you've got that toehold in there, we can, we can introduce nutrition and we, we do sleep monitoring and stress, you know, but through heart, uh, heart rate variability monitoring and just see where that, where the rub points are during the day for individuals and teams. Um, you know, social networking, et cetera, the kind of communication and, and social pro, um, um, uh, calendar programming, et cetera, making sure it all ties back. Yet with another finance team, not interested in PT, not interested in exercise, uh, you know, too busy, different different kind of culture, different Im- imperatives. But nutrition, everybody was mad for it. So we, we leveraged the nutrition aspect of the program and that was our takeoff point. And from that, we're getting buy-in to the, to the mm. activity, buy-in to the other areas of the program. Um, and uh, and IT, all they want to do is hang out and, and drink beer on Friday nights and that's how they use, you know, these kind of... So in culture, I, I don't know what it is. I haven't read anything that kind of ex- it, that convinces me that anyone knows what it really is and how to explain it. It's it's metaphysical, you know, so it's, it doesn't have mm. it has time and space and vibe and all this kind of stuff. But one thing that really sticks with me, apart from being deliberate about it rather than leaving it to default or being piecemeal, like under-investing, uh, is this the, the notion that culture has good and bad in it and our job is really to dampen the bad and to amplify the good. And that's what I mean. If, if one if, if one culture is strong on physical activity, get around it, pour some resources in it and then start to fill the program out from that, that centre of gravity. If it's around nutrition, do that. If it's around leadership development, start. That's the start point, and then kind of work out because it's a complex, adaptive human system, not a linear uh, Excel spreadsheet DD process. Mm. Um, yeah. So let's now look at your pedigree. You um, thirty years in the special air service, eleven deployments over eleven years. You've you've just written the book, uh, Eleven Bats. 
tell us about your experience because I'm going to assume a lot of your because it's one thing to train for it, but then it's another thing to actually live it and do it. And I, I guess in the time that we've got, give me the summary of what are the biggest lessons that you've learned that you share with people in the book that you're now taking forward into the way that you change organisations. Yeah, there's. I've I've spent a fair bit of time reflecting on that writing the book, which was. Um, a wonderful experience and it's actually one of the things I've learned uh, journaling and um, stopping and reflecting, doing deep personal reflection. Um, I do it a lot. Uh, I do it, I think, uh, organically. It's always been in me to, to journal and reflect and it's actually part of a cognitive behavioural uh, approaches uh, to, to um, improving um, how you think um, how you perform cognitively. Reflection and journaling is, is super powerful. So the, the book, available in all fine bookstores, of course, is uh, was it was the biggest journal uh, I've ever written and, I, and I, it was cathartic and wonderful experience and I, yeah, I look right. forward to, to doing it again and I encourage everyone listening to, to write their book. Every, you know, I, I, I would assume that more than half of the people listening would love to do it and uh, it's just it's such a great uh, cognitive exercise um, mm. But in terms of you know, there's a there's a few things. There's, there's a couple of just bullet points uh, that that I find I've learned, and I wish I had learned earlier. I wish I I could go back and tell my 21 uh, year old self um, about. And you know, it's it's some pretty fundamental stuff. So one one of the things I talk about is that transmit doesn't equal receive. You know, in the military in particular, you give orders at oh, wow, certain points, so and yeah, right. You tell someone what to do, and it, but, you, but for for so long you just expect that they didn't do it, and you become frustrated if they didn't. But now we know how the human mind and, and communication works. Um, when you're talking to someone, just because you've said it doesn't mean that they received it, and we know that it depends on a whole bunch of factors. It's so complex. So to leaders, I say, you know, you you not only need to uh, ask or task people or say things, you need to kind of double back and go just. Talk back what I just said. What does that mean to you? And, you know, explore that. And I think that missing communication in organisations is probably the biggest problem, isn't it? I, I hope you'd agree with that, Kerr, when the kind of miscommunication or lot, no communication. So I, I would ask, one thing I've learned is that transmit does not equal receive. And uh, and I think once you kind of uh, adopt that thinking um, it changes, or hopefully, it changes the communication with people, and uh, also. And I think that goes both ways, and I think that's where a lot of people fall short because they think, yeah. well, transmit doesn't always equal receive from the top down, but communication goes both ways. It goes down the chain, but it also goes up the chain. Correct. Is that something you 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 found breaks as well? Yeah. So if you think of going back to human networks or human teams, they're much, they're very, uh, they're they're very uh, neural networks. Um, both literally and figuratively. So if you yeah, imagine right. everyone on a, on a dot on a page and then you're linked up with everyone and if you don't get on with someone or you don't communicate with someone, that neural pathway is weak. And uh, mm. and then if you only have – you see, so I won't go oh, into it. You, you can imagine that. And what you yep, want is yep. strong neural pathways across the whole system. And that goes exactly to your point. It's not one way firing. Uh, that's the difference. It's back and forth firing yeah. that keeps them healthy. And I, if you think about, you know, go, I could go into neurons and, and myelin sheathing, sheathing and um, um, you know, excitatory uh, uh, power and etc. But all of those, all of that, that um, technical kind of appreciation of, of of the brain, for example, happens. I think in teams as well. So we need to treat that mm. those communications. I think once you start to educate yourself around that type of thinking it makes it does make a difference i prefer over communicating and it kind of leads mm. me to another point I, I i talk about with um young leaders in particular which is probably my passion i'm not really interested in old grumpy ceos as much as i am in the in the emerging talent because i think that's where you can have the most impact both organizationally and independently but the other point i'd say is communicating in five ways i heard it in a harvard business lecture or a wharton business school lecture when i was over there about three years ago and it's um it was they, they were talking about, you know, you've got to manage in five directions in sales. You know, manage up, down, sideways, peers, sideways to clients, and also manage yourself, this kind of... But I think in communication, there's, the, again, uh, communicating in five directions is really important. In the military, if you're on the front line and you're, you're engaging with the enemy, you've got to talk to planes, 
uh, to your immediate peers. You've got to organise yourself. Headquarters is always tapping you on the shoulder, asking for information. And I think it's a great analogy for how you, you should be in the organisation. And you should weight them all uh, temporarily, but they all should have equal valence. And that means that, you know, don't, don't be that guy who just communicates up all the time and not down or always down and it's one of the tricks when you're coming through another another lesson i've learned very hard to make that transition from mate to boss um, inside organizations and that's something that needs you know kind of tending to um, just on that because this is something we get quite a lot from our business owners is um you know, once business owners or leaders cross a certain boundary and become mate, it's almost like there's a dethroning of authority that can often take place. How do you maintain authority but still connect at a human level or at a relative, like at a relationship level so that they can feel like you're a mate and not just their boss? Or is that something that just can't happen when it comes to a high performance environment? Yeah, it's, it, it can be tough. Uh, and in the military, we get around it by posting sideways. So, you know, if you reach, if you're, if you're on a team for five years and you've kind of risen through the top and now you're the two I see and you're, you're about to be promoted to a team commander, uh, then generally you'll go to a new team. And that kind of helps or assists with that because it's a real problem. Uh, it can be a real problem and, and individuals mm. can struggle with that. How do they assert authority with their mates? Um, mm. And uh, so there's, you know, we, we have a, a saying that we're peers amongst, we're, we're um, leaders but amongst peers, amongst equals. And, uh, and so, so the way we get around that is just, again, this boring notion of communicating, you know, sitting down with the team and saying, this, this, is, this is where I'm at. I'm now in charge. If you've got a hedge fund that's only got 20 odd people in it um, and you're going to be promoted, it's, 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 you know, it goes without saying that you will be mate to leader or manager or whatever that, that you know, commander in the military. So that those conversations need to take place. And, uh, and so I, I often talk about, you know, leadership's not one thing. It's not a character. In fact, I think leadership arrives. I don't think it's a, a thing in us. I think mm. the, the requirement for leadership arrives. And you so need to true. be agile enough to be leader, mate, steward, marriage counsellor, bloody, you know, uh, financial advisor. Um, when you take on that and you become more of a steward rather than a leader. And I think that kind of frees you to kind of have that conversation uh, a, a little easier, but it's certainly in those situations where you you are going from mate to leader in the same team, you're taking over. Um, you need to you know sit down with the team and kind of just put a few rules in place, and that comes again straight out of the cognitive behavioural approaches rule book. Um, you know, set up a, 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 some guidelines, some handrails for the new relationship, for the new way of being. There's this there's this notion I love out of the mission critical team world of liminality, and uh, liminality in short is you're not quite what you, you're left what you used to be, and you're not quite what you are. And the best way to uh, uh, to, to describe that is like the surf zone. So you you're not you're not on the beach anymore, but you can feel the bottom. Um, but you're not in the ocean yet, but you can't see the. You, but it's but you, you could you know, you're kind of in between the ocean and, and and land, and I think that transition for leaders is something I'm really interested in. How do we transition those, those and manage talent effectively through those parts? And I think it's a nice way to picture it. It is complex, ugly, uh, difficult, um, you know, ambiguous. Uh, so, but uh, that's where I think we really need to get some resources as well to talent manage, particularly those people you want to keep for, for a long time. Mm. So, 11 bats, um, it seems to me you used cricket as a way to create a consolidation and a solidarity within the units that you were deployed with. But it also seems from the notes that I have here that there was um, far reaching effects beyond just a team building exercise while you guys were uh, off the tools. Yeah, but it emerged over time. You know, 11 bats over 11 years, 11 point, yeah, it's kind of um, worked out nicely. But, you know, the, the very first bat, uh, we were sitting around a Satterbat up in northern Afghanistan and we are doing some night missions and whatnot and it was pretty boring actually. We didn't do much. A lot of the missions got turned off um, and we're on the border uh, 
tracking the um, tracking the bad guys when the when the war had great meaning because we were chasing down Osama and all these mates and up in the hills and and, and uh, up in the, um, the northern regions of Pakistan etc. Anyway, we got a bit bored. We're sitting around. We're getting rocketed and attacked most nights and. Um, and during the afternoons, we were just kind of <laughs> we're getting bored. We're getting rocketed and attacked every night. Yeah, well, but we're a little well, bored. That, yeah, it's just kind of. Sc- <laughs> I know it's it has high consequence. I know, and I, I shouldn't be so flippant, but uh, no, but it, it does become very it's routine. Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so, but in the late parts of the day, we we, we were we were sitting around and just said, you know, I wish we had a cricket bat. And our interpreter said, oh, I'll, I'll go across the border and get you one. So in a daring raid, I like to say, John was his name, <laughs> the interpreter, ducked across into Pakistan into the federated areas of the States to win us a cricket, to get us a cricket bat and brought it back into Afghanistan where it was banned. You know, you might, you might recall. And so we used to play cricket there. I had no idea I was going to be collecting bats. It just started off with this Shahid Afridi shitty old bat that was warped and whatnot. But it struck me, and this is kind of goes to the essence of the bats, it struck me. We were appealing, you know, how's that? And laughing and sledging each other. And here are these Taliban or whoever, the anti-coalition forces outside getting ready to attack us at night. They would have been hearing us having this uproarious laughter and I used to feel like we'd got one over them. You know, we're winning the war on jocularity or fun because they're trying to stamp it out. <laughs> and here we are having an absolute ball uh, with the interpreters and, and all the uh, all the Afghani staff there. But um, it, 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 I had all the guys sign that bat and that's set up through tr- the tradition. I, t- I, I, t- I take a football and a cricket bat. Even today, you know, if any of the businesses I work in, they'll go, here's Harry, what's he doing with the footy in his hand or shining a cricket ball? Uh, it's novelty. Introduce novelty into serious areas, and I'd encourage you mm. in your businesses to introduce novelty. It has great effect, uh, stimulus. Um, so, yeah, they sign the bats, and, and the rest is history, so they say. We, the bats have been used um, to gain intelligence in the in the, in the mountains of, uh, of, of uh, Timor-Leste, where we spent some time with um, Alfredo Renato, who I found a charming... Uh, a charming man, you know, he's a naughty boy, of course. He did some bad things, uh, but we—he was being, um, you know, uh, uh, sought after by media and, and spies and government people. And we used cricket as a way of uh, of channeling people's movements into his into his headquarters, um, it, like it's some kind of Hogan's Heroes ruse. And when they stopped for a game of cricket, we'd get photos and take collect information on them. Um, yeah, you know, without them knowing, um, we used it to to build rapport with the locals. You know, you build rapport with street kids. Um, they know all the comings and goings of everyone. Um, you build trust with them a game of cricket and give them a cricket bat or whatever. And they're not long before they're telling you, "Oh, that bloke's not from around here." Oh, is that right? Okay, well, thanks for that. You know, so you can build rapport in that way. We even had a. Uh, on the cover of the book, I think, is an image of um, of us playing cricket in the Cod Valley in, in 2005, and we used to monitor the Taliban on their Motorola radios, and the interpreter, we were playing a game of cricket, and the interpreter said, hey, Harry, the Taliban are watching you play cricket. I can hear him chatting on the radio. I said, oh, what, what are they saying? He says, they, they reckon that you're rubbish cricketers. <laughs> and I was furious. I said, give me that bloody radio, tell him that. Tell them to come down here and we'll play them in a the game of cricket and whoever loses has to piss off out of the valley, you know. And um, anyway, they declined because they thought we might bring the planes and bomb them if they come out of the hills, which we probably would have. But um, uh, so, you know, it's had this far-reaching effect. And, and of course, mate, we, there's a lot of trauma and expeed, uh, extreme experiences, Kerwin, on these, these you know, which you can imagine. Um, there's a mm, lot of serious of stuff and seeing your mates get hurt really you know, impacts you. So cricket becomes this way of unwinding the, 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 the tension. Mm. You know, I know after a really heavy day fighting, we lost a lot of people. And uh, we came back to to play a game of cricket on the on the on the helo pad, and it was like zombie. We're so so tired and um, you know kind of depressed, I guess, as a, as a collective. But you know, you play a game of cricket. Someone takes a wicket, and there's a hey, and there's an appeal, and someone sledge or a joke, and it just lifts the mood. And next thing you know, people are smiling and unwinding. And to as a psychologist now, I used to watch that and think, what a what a wonderful game cricket is to. To, uh, to to be able to to, to 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 have an impact a psychological impact on a, a group of people like that so it's become a become uh, something I'm really really love you know and re- reflect kindly on obviously through the book and so this this book really is uh, a journal at large like it, it really is about your ex- it's not just about the the organizational psychology of spec ops teamwork um, it really is about your journey and your experience over those 11 deployments over 11 years. 
Yeah, definitely, and uh, and and a little bit in kind of what how I got there. I, I think there's you know there's this great man kind of I suppose perception that people have, and now and now we've got women coming through into special ops, which is fantastic. This great person perspective, you know, they they expect that special operations people are big and you know call of duty kind of muscles in their shit type of people and and it's just not true the uh there, there's room for that and there are people who are who we need to be strong and big and break down walls and carry a lot of things long way but it's much more nuanced than that and i hope i catch capture mm-hmm. that in the book too you know i'm a skinny wiry little fella and um yeah i'm six foot on a, on a good day and uh weigh about 80 kilos uh, but you know that 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 the very nature of your kind of anth- you know, your body composition um, suits you for certain roles that we don't often hear mm. about um, in these environments. Um, yeah, you know, so I, I thought what I hope is a book is an insight into, you know, I can only speak for our unit and and for myself, but you know that we're just we're, we're normal people at heart we're just kind of a little bit crazier maybe than the, the than the next person um and you know if you go back to that grit and that doggedness it's probably uh it's probably that that, that inner competitiveness um that that, that that singles it out and a little bit of as i said craziness and i think the book kind of um just brings a different perspective certainly that's been the feedback um, and, and, you know, in, in the modern, in, in these times where the, 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 there's a, you know, a lot in the press, um, I hope that that kind of just gives a counter narrative uh, that, um, you know, we're, we're pretty good blokes and top chicks and uh, we, we've all got mortgages and, and wives and, um, and uh, we suffer the same pressures and, and enjoy the same things in life. We're not uh, these kind of robotic Call of Duty blokes that, uh, you know, just kick around waiting in the dark for something to go wrong. Yeah, I I think it's it's fair to say you've you've lived, you know, and I can even see by your face you've had a an interesting life. Um, I'm only thirty six, on mate. The- Look what it's done to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say he's, he's probably like thirty two, but um, <laughs> I, 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 what I'd be curious to know, and I know this isn't going to be an easy question to ask, but I am interested because you've 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 been on many sides of many things. Like you've obviously been a civilian before you're in the military. You know, you obviously worked your way up into the military to you know the team commander. Um, you know, as well as team specialist, you then worked not just in the on the active side, on the inactive side. You've been a student, you've been a peer, you've been a mentor and a teacher. You've seen active combat and inactive combat. You've used the skills in life, in military, and in organisations. And I know this isn't necessarily a fair question to ask, but the question that I have for you is. From the title of the sum total of the life experience that you've had, which would be more than what most people would probably live in at least eleven lifetimes, what's been the biggest lesson that you've been able to take away from everything you've done that you carry with you today, that you used, you know, when you were trying to qualify for the special air service, that you used, you know, when you were being rocketed and mortared and losing mates, you know, uh, on on some random Tuesday, and that you're now using to complete a book and even work with, you know, challenging CEOs and teams. Is there a is there a constant when it comes to a certain lesson that you carry with you always? Yeah, well, what a, yes, I suppose there's no single headline. Um, no, the, the word that was question. flashing, yeah, the word that's flashing through my head, and I suppose I have reflected on this is just self self belief. Um, you know, so and what underpins that is being a good person, as I said before. You know, making it your mission to improve and in, inspire people, which means being a good listener, uh, a good observer, but. Um, but that supports like an inner belief. Whenever I've, I, I talk about it in the book, and I just actually just wrote a, an article for a, for an online um, forum about the commentator. Uh, so for most of us, that commentator's in our head, or this, it's the seed of self doubt. Um, again, I, I, I was just talking to a guy who's doing that that long duration effort. I, I asked him, "What's the biggest challenge or fear that you, sh- you face now, one week out from competition after two years of training?" Um, he wants to break the world record. Uh, and he said it's just the self doubt, those moments of self doubt. So the way I, the way I positioned that late in my career, but um, not too late, was um, through work with psychologists about reframing the discussion in my head and claiming back the authority. So I branded that voice of self doubt that we all have, unless you're a complete narcissist and sociopath, um, we all have the self self doubt, um, and nine times out of ten, he's spruiking bullshit because. You know, those they don't they won't like me, 
uh, Harry, they're not even thinking about you. Don't worry, they, 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 they're not even thinking whether they like you or not. So it's 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 how to how to address the commentator and uh, the self doubt. So and that's by having those conversations and reframing, reframing that uh, in your own mind. And so that and that goes to maintaining that belief in yourself. If you're a good person and you treat other people well and you leave a good legacy or aim to leave a good legacy, if you've got that, if you if you uh, have your values proposition within yourself sorted out, then you should believe in yourself. And that, that may lead down the path of a bit of fake it till you make it. I don't mind that that notion. Um, no one runs off the bat. You know, you've got to crawl, walk, and, and, and before you run. Um, so, you know, just have the belief to keep going. And when, and, uh, when it does uh, go a bit pear-shaped or you, you've got these moments of self-doubt, stop and have a conversation with yourself. Um, you know, mm. and, and if you need to have a conversation, I do it with the commentator. So... You know, on long, long, long duration efforts, the hardest days of my life have been in on with with a pack on my back in the hills of Afghanistan on ten day odd patrols, uh, up in the mountains above the snow line and uh, at altitude. You have some real life affirming moments on the side of a mountain um, about why you're there and <laughs> and what mm. the fuck you, you, you how you got yourself into that. And in those moments, it's an ongoing internal uh, conversation um, that you've got to dominate, you know, and, and, and so that, that, that's probably the biggest uh, biggest thing that kind of lingers with me from my, my entire service, from a, a bun- apart from a bunch of other smaller lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, but, the, uh, but have fun. That's the other thing too, I guess. You know, life's... Mm. This is such a wonderful thing we're blessed with, you know. It's, uh, mm. a, a, you know, life, you know, stop and reward yourself and reward others and, and um, you know, revel in the in the wonder of it all at the right times. Um, I, I, again, I see it in businesses. They don't really play very well. They work really well, but they don't do the play thing very well. And one thing we did in the regiment was we worked hard. But we also played hard, and I think I think they're really important. And what does that mean? Does it mean getting going out and getting on the grogs all the time? Not necessarily. It means training together, eating together, um, you know, spending social time together. Um, those types of things. That's that's another area I think businesses could could improve their yeah. performance um, in Agreed. as well. Harry, I've really enjoyed this conversation, mate. Thank you so much for taking the time. 11 bats, 11 deployments over 11 years from 2002 to 2013. Uh, A story of combat, cricket, and the SAS. Where can people get the book? Where can they get their hands on this thing? Yeah, all fine bookstores, mate. It's available now on audio. Uh, it's about, it's uh, it should be in all bookstores. I think you know, kind of airports or Dimmicks or um or the department stores. So it's go- it's going well enough. Um, it'll be out in the UK in July. So we're uh, just making some um, well done. preambles towards that. And uh, yeah, but uh, I'm I'm just thankful it's not a complete dud. I'm relieved. <laughs> well, mate, you got some great reviews, and I'm I'm keen to read it now myself because the only other books that I read outside of um, psychology and um, performance books really are you know stories in most cases of combat. And so I want to get my hands on this as well. Um, congratulations for writing the book, mate. I've been trying to write a book now for 11, or not trying, I've been saying I'm going to write a book now for about 11, of, 11 or so years. So the fact that you've done it, thank you. It's just another kick up the ass for me to get my, my, my finger into gear. Um, but also you have the Stoughton Group. For people who, wanna, who are interested in organizational performance and, and what you guys do there, where can they find out more about um, what you guys do? Yeah, just stoughtongroup.com.au, uh, LinkedIn as well. Um, so, yeah, but... Um, have a bit of a dive we're just kind of rebuilding everything at the moment but it's all it's all live uh and join us on the on the journey you know we're not we're not here to build a multi-billion dollar company or world domination we're here to kind of spread awareness and gather information uh and uh, and learn more about um about human performance and um how we can all everyone wants to improve so we want to help them where, where we can and uh, and spread the spread the news about um about those those performance enhancements and and lessons that we've learned so uh yeah join the community fantastic harry thank you so much ladies and gentlemen harry moffat and this is unstoppable
This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business, but we do it from an immersive, but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly so if you'd like to find out more information kerwinray.com